Welcome back to the channel everyone and if you're new welcome we're out in our large compost heated greenhouse and we're in the process of basically documenting everything we're doing to the greenhouse to make it growable in winter and to be able to get some harvest and eat some food. So we went the cheapest route we possibly could to build a winter greenhouse. We are in zone 5A 4B so we see some cold temperatures and we're reflecting it in the greenhouse with only one layer. So with this second layer of poly we got on it's hot in here. I'm actually sweating you just watched me throw that poly on with my coat on which was a terrible idea because now I'm drenched in sweat we're sitting about 59 60 degrees in the greenhouse and that is right next to our door there this wall is colder when there's no Sun so I'm surprised to see good temps down there that is awesome upon arrival walking in the greenhouse you got 60 degree air you're met with and that is all thanks to our compost heating system down here now we're pushing about a hundred degrees give or take it's running pretty constantly turn our water on i had that shut off our water was shut off here just because it was a very very cloudy day i'm oh, picking up about 89 degrees on there it's really hard to get a reading on this i almost burnt myself at first because it was a very hot transfer of heat and then it slowly kind of dissipates we've got a hundred foot of copper coil that's quarter inch running through that pile but it's around a pole it wasn't really spread out through the whole pile i think next year i can pull some higher temps off that if i change up the system a little bit but we're in good shape this is going to work for me this winter we've got at least 100 degrees plus coming out of that it's hard to read because it turns on and off and then just bilges so we're sitting here trying to get a reading as it's pumping and then stopping so it'll heat up real quick and then it'll shut back down so getting a good reading is not the easiest on that little copper tube especially when i'm shining a laser beam at it to try and read that temp so what i've been doing with all of this stuff just a small experiment in the making here so i put all these bricks up here probably a half an hour ago now let's get a reading on them they were somewhere in the 50s when i put them over here now it's six about 63 degrees and a few 64 all right so 64 on this one 63 about 60 this one's further away so this shiny tube is also heating up here it's not really easy to pick up any definite temperatures on a shiny surface so that's not a guarantee but it looks like it's warming up so this piece of iron is 54 55 all of the bricks 57 55 about 55 on all the bricks so we've raised a few degrees in here at least seven degrees or so seven eight degrees so i'm going to stick this brick right in the center of that and this bad boy is reading about 55 degrees on there 56 degrees so we'll go with 56 and we'll see what that does in about 10 to 15 minutes so this metal tube i was taking a temperature on is just some free ducting that is basically going to pump air and split that air off so i'm kind of warming this bank i'm going to really add on this i want to build some type of nice heat sink that's close to my water so i can really amplify all of the heat together from one compost pile both with water and air so as we're traveling all the heat through the metal tube it's definitely warming it up and then pulsing all of that warm air into our poly tunnel here and we've got all of the heat from the floor as always i've already shown a lot of this and i hate to be so repetitive but i like to show all of the data and how this is working and all of the kinks in the way there's definitely a lot of figuring out to do when you're doing all of this diy heading over to the new poly tunnel we just threw this up it is not 100 percent pulled tight i just haphazardly kind of wedged it in i also took this little elbow and made myself a nice little gasket with some metal tape when in doubt this stuff is absolutely great so i'm taking this geothermal tube and aiming it right in the tunnel here so we're going to seal the other end and i'm going to leave this end kind of gapped i got a little rose bush i got a bunch of onions and a bunch of sorrel so this is all sorrel seed here you can see that the geothermal here has really been providing a decent warm area for all of this life to sprout right here not a whole lot down on this side this gets tread on a little bit but for the most part that geothermal is pushing some decent temps out at least 50 degrees is blowing out of there and then we'll be able to shoot it right down the tunnel and basically heat this up in a sense 
So we're basically just using the earth as a battery here and pulling all of the air from inside the greenhouse, which is definitely warm. So geothermal is probably not the best thing right now, but we're pulling that geothermal from about two and a half, three feet off the ground. So it's a lower airspace that it's pulling from, same as our compost. We're just pulling cool air from maybe a foot or two off the ground. And everyone knows heat rises. So all these tunnels are basically just holding all the heat closer to the floor. This geothermal tube here gave me the idea of being inside this tunnel to basically just run an elbow and pump the 50 degree air into this tunnel as long as that little fan's running and all of these tunnels protect a lot at nighttime. Same with our second layer of poly. That six to eight inch air gap of dead air is holding some great insulation. It's pretty sound deadening and I'm getting some echo effect in here. Hopefully it doesn't translate too bad on the camera here. This was the first day after we got our second layer of poly on. I wanted to come out and see what kind of temperatures we had because it's 25 degrees, 25, 30 mile an hour wind and we've got zero sunlight. We haven't had any sunlight all day. It's been the thickest clouds. It basically feels like it's dark outside. There is not any solar activity, just barely enough to run our solar systems, but not enough to really send any heat into the greenhouse. So being able to come out here and be warm and be overwarmed when I'm dressed for winter and come in here is awesome. I'm super enthralled with the fact that I can heat all of this up for free and use all of this solar power to achieve free food throughout the winter and a healthy source of food nonetheless. So I made my way back down to this side of the greenhouse here. I don't know how long it's been, maybe 10 minutes or so. So that is sitting about 60 degrees already and it's cooler down on this side. So the closer we get, it's already transferring some good heat in there. So that is showing 61 it was 62 so you can see how the grades of heat are traveling and transferring into that that is what we want and that is going to be basically the end goal of this entire system so we're trying to store as much heat as energy in a thermal mass that we possibly can so that energy is re-released as heat throughout the night. So I'm going to build upon this idea and try and store as much possible energy in thermal mass as I can to be shared and reshared with the greenhouse at nighttime. And that gets me thinking about heating the entire greenhouse. Now, everybody loves to come out and have a heated greenhouse, but that's not always the way to do it. I was trying to do that for the longest time, just heat the whole airspace, heat this whole greenhouse. But I find myself just basically directing the heat at the plants and everything else in here is basically residual. I know I have my compost heater blowing half of the air out onto those bricks to heat them up. So it's certainly warming this airspace up. It feels like springtime out here. So having a heated greenhouse is awesome, but if you're going to pay to heat it, you're going to want to put the most minimal amount of heat into the greenhouse and basically put it right to the floor, put it right to your plants, put it to the soil and put it to any solar or thermal banks that you have. That alludes to the next topic, uh, heating costs and BTUs and how many BTUs, which is a British thermal unit, how many it requires to actually do this and get this system going. So we've got maybe three tons of compost. There's about four cubic yards per ton of wood chips. We've got about 12 to 13, maybe 14 cubic yards. So I figure we've got like three to four ton maybe. So I'll bring a video for everybody on BTUs, composting, and the Jean Payne process and the process of how many BTUs it takes to heat air and how many BTUs it's going to take to heat water which is significantly more. So there's a lot more involved in this and I've been doing a ton of research over the last eight to 10 years. So there's a lot that goes into this and figuring out the size of pile you need and the gallon per minute water flow you're going to use to harvest that energy. So there is a little bit of math and work to figure all of it out. But for the most part, we just winged it on the first couple years in our little greenhouse, kind of figuring out things on our own. Transitioning from a small Jean Payne heating system to this very large one was a definite upgrade and we were able to acquire a whole lot more power and energy output. I'd like to thank everybody for watching this video and if anybody has any questions, comments, or suggestions, drop it in the comments below. I love to hear everybody's feedback and think outside the box. You guys might see something from behind 
behind that camera that I'm not catching and I always get good ideas from you guys so thank you for that and thank you to all my subscribers we're trying to make this process happen and we're trying to document the whole thing along the way